Welcome to the Jackson Rudolph Podcast. I'm your host, Jackson Rudolph, and this is episode 126. We are back. I have finished my internal medicine rotation at medical school. We had a week of orientation here in D.C., which is why you see yet another new backdrop for the podcast behind me. We're making whatever we can work. Uh, And unfortunately, as I was wrapping up some medical school stuff over the last couple of weeks, I was not able to make it to the Quebec Open. But our guest on the show today was absolutely at the Quebec Open, winning the men's CMX Weapons overall grand championship, his first overall grand as an adult in his first season as an adult, mind you. The one, the only, the truth, Ben Jones. How's it going, Ben? It's going good. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely, man. And and as always on this show, since we stream on. Of course, they know who you are. Uh, A couple of viewers that maybe don't see sport karate all the time. So I want to give you a chance here at the top of the show uh, to just tell the audience a little bit about who you are and uh, introduce yourself to us. Cool. Yeah. So my name's Ben, as Jackson said, Um, I've been competing about, uh, getting close to nine years now, I think uh, consecutively at least. Before then, I had some local stuff here and there, but pretty pretty legit competition for about nine years now. Um, I was, yeah, this was like my third overall, at least weapons overall, individual this past weekend at Quebec um, on Team Paul Mitchell. Got on last year. It's been a good good last year and good year this year so far. Um, 18 years old, just actually moved to Madison, Wisconsin at the beginning of the year. I work for Infinity Martial Arts as a head instructor, and it's all going great so far. That's awesome, man. And I'm super proud of what you've done, kind of taking your career, not only continuing to kill it uh, in the competitive realm, but also spreading your knowledge and uh, really sharing your passion with with a bunch of kids and students at the school by working with Infinity. Um, And and that's always a career path that I love to see people go on. And, you know, that's something I preach about sport karate all the time on this show is all of the opportunities that it presents you. We hear about the sport karate athletes that go on and do stunts, and we've got a bunch of athletes that are very successful doing that. There are a ton of opportunities to go into the martial arts business world, whether it be instructing, school owning, or some variation that combines a bunch of different things. There's a ton of opportunities in that space. Um, And then you can also use those opportunities uh, to leverage academic opportunities, you know, going to college, doing this, that, and the other, which is the route that I kind of chose. So it's cool to see kind of in the history of the podcast Podcast. We've had people that have kind of gone all of these different directions, uh, and you're just another great example of somebody um, that's staying in the martial arts, continuing, and it's going to help a lot of people along the way. Uh, so the first thing that I want to get into is Quebec Open, because that's the thing that just happened, right? Hopefully, uh, some of the people tuning in here today were watching on the Juventex TV pay-per-view. I think that's a huge uh, step in the right direction for our sport. Not only the fact that we had a pay-per-view for this night show, but also the fact that the night show was a visual spectacle, right? It, it was one of, if not the best-looking night shows that we've ever seen in the sport, right? From, from the lighting and every all of the professionalism that went into the production. And so I just want to give you a chance to tell us about that experience in general, and then we'll kind of get more detailed with the questioning here. Sure. Yeah, the whole tournament overall was great. Um, it was good to be back. I went in 2018 and 19, I'm pretty sure. Then obviously everything shut down for a couple of years, but I mean, it was great. And um, they really did a nice job, in my opinion, making sure the competitors felt really welcome. And then especially in the night show, making them feel like they were the stars. And it wasn't necessarily, even though I really liked this, the promoters were in their own opening demo. Um, But the show itself was very much like, how can we make these competitors look as amazing as they are or amplify, you know, how amazing they are. So besides the night show itself though, I think the tournament overall was ran very well. I was a little confused (laughs) most of the time because my French is not up to par. But um, overall, I had Esteban as my um, professional translator. So I I got the information I needed and everything. Um, You know, no tournament's perfect, but I think this was definitely one of the best I've been to in my career. Um, It was ran pretty well. I think I was done by 6.30 on Friday night, and we didn't even start on time. (laughs) So, and it's not like there were small divisions. It was like... We had like 13 in you know, one of our weapons divisions and like 12 
eight to 10, somewhere in that range. So it, it wasn't like, you know, like four competitors in every division. So we got done fast. They were just moving. Once we got started, we were moving quick. And um, yeah, Friday night went really well. Same with Saturday morning. Um, I know we once again didn't start right on time, but we were done really fast. You know, once we got started, it was moving quick. We finished it up, went right to the next thing. Um, some confusion about if we're doing a runoff or not. And then we ended up not doing it. But, you know, overall, can't complain at all. Definitely one of the, the better tournament experiences I've had. Mm, for sure. And, and super high praise, right? And And the big thing is two of the biggest things that competitors always ask for, efficiency and then for lack of a better phrase, like being put on a pedestal, like, hey, do something to make the competitors look good, right? Don't just have us on a random puzzle mat stage with like some type of a draped backdrop, but like do something to make the show look like a spectacle, right? Do something to give the competitors that platform. And Quebec sounds like they checked both of those boxes. I hadn't, I actually hadn't heard anybody talk about the efficiency of the event yet, but that's something that doesn't just impact the top competitors. That's something that from your your best of the best uh, best of the best black belts all the way to your first time white belt showing up at their first karate tournament. That's going to enhance the tournament experience for everybody, right? Um, so that's something that I think is super important, and uh, we all got to kind of tip our cap to uh, Sam and David and Claire for being able to put together um, an event that was that was. So so amazing from a spectating standpoint in terms of being able to put on a show for spectators, um, but also for the athletes and just being able to make things run smooth and, and put together a tournament that runs the way that competitors would like it to flow. Right. Um, and you mentioned some pretty solid division sizes too, which is awesome. Um, I want to dive in real quick. This isn't something that we had planned to talk about, but you bring up that kind of classic question, you know, on like midday Saturday of, is there going to be a runoff? Are we just going to stage? What are we doing? Right. Because like before I came into the adult division, it was a given that the adults were always going to run off. Right. Like I remember watching daytime runoffs of Matt and Kalman and Mark and Rudy and all those guys and different tournaments would take a different number of them on stage. Oftentimes it would wind up being all four of them. So it wouldn't take away some of those stars of the show. It would just kind of narrow down the division a little bit. But to be fair, back when there was always a runoff, there was also always the traditional bladed, the traditional non bladed. They had every single weapons winner going into the weapons grand, unlike right now where it's separated. But it still is kind of up in the air do the promoters of that event want to do a runoff or not want to do a runoff uh, what's your opinion on that whole thing would you like to see it more standardized do you not really care do you like it when a runoff happens and you've got a chance to knock out some of your competition a little early before you're up on the show or do you like like nah, i just want to win my division and get on stage which is what i feel most competitors probably would like uh, but just kind of generally your reactions to the adult runoff situation and when it does and when it doesn't happen sure I mean, I think overall, whoever's going to win that overall at the night show is just going to be the best competitor at the tournament, So, or the best competitor that day. So overall, I don't think I really care that much, as long as we know, especially ahead of time. Because um, if we get there like Saturday, and we do a, all the trad divisions in the morning, and then create a forms after, and then it's just this waiting, and you know, are we doing it? Are we not doing it? We were told yes, and then later on, I think, which I did ask, I was like, well, there's three of us, and we would just eliminate one person. Like, do we need, you know, to save two minutes of stage time, really, basically? Um, or can we just all go? Because I know, like, with Brennan Green, he won his first division. I know that was huge. He was so excited to go to stage. And, you know, same, obviously, I was excited to go right to stage. Rashad was, you know, too. We all talked about it. We're like, let's try to convince them to not make us do a runoff because we all wanted to be on stage together. You know, it, everybody wants to go to that stage, especially that stage. Yeah. So I think overall, if we just know ahead of time, that would be best or if it's standardized. So this whole year, every time, unless there's only two winners for, you know, men's weapons, we're always going to have a runoff. If it's that and we come in expecting it, I think you know, that would be the way to go. I think for the majority of us, yeah, we don't want to have a runoff because we want to get straight to stage. Um, I know when I was a junior, that was something I was looking forward to for competing in adults. It's like, I don't have to do a runoff, even though like the majority of my, my junior career's best moments were in runoffs. Um, but yeah, it was something I was looking forward to. Like, once I'm an adult, 
I don't have to do runoffs anymore. I win and I go straight to stage. Um, so in a way, that's kind of what I was wanting and expecting. Um, but overall, I think if it's just standardized across the whole circuit, I think that would be just the best way to go. Yeah, I agree. And I also think I think that if if NASCA does choose to standardize it, it shouldn't be like always running it down to two because that's really not the nature of forms and weapons. Right. Forms and weapons is not a, a head to head sport. It is there's a field of competitors and who can rise above them to be the number one number one guy or girl. Right. Um, it's like if, if we think about my generation. Well, like just me versus Reed or me versus Cole or me versus Tyler, like none of those things are as exciting as all of us on stage trying to see who's actually going to come out on top. And it's the same in your generation. It's a whole lot better to see you and Rashad and Esteban and Dawson and Alex and Jake or whoever makes it and qualifies for that final instead of like, let's just get a head to head showdown between two of them. Right. Yeah. And, and I also think that from a runoff standpoint, you also have to look at how are you going to protect your show, right? Because let's say that you've got four people that are on stage. Three of them are the ones that are like the, the top ranked star competitors that are going to make a really good show. But somebody, you know, they've been working really hard. They did a good form. Maybe somebody else had a mistake and, and they earned that first opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Number one, I think they deserve the right to go on stage because they earned that win, just like the other people who got those wins. Right. right. So they deserve that opportunity to go on stage. But as a promoter, do you really want to risk one or two or heaven forbid, all three of your stars dropping in the runoff? And now all of a sudden your show doesn't look nearly like what you anticipated it looking like. Right. Um, so from a protecting the show standpoint, I think you have to be careful with with how you do runoffs. Um, and in, in the grand scheme of things, forms and weapons is not a head-to-head a -head sport. And so we really don't want to set it up for that. I understand U.S. Open historically has done more head-to-head -head matchups, but that's because they're trying to fit more divisions for more age groups all into the show, which is one thing because they're limited by TV time. But for yeah. something like Quebec, where you're not limited by ESPN saying, hey, you got two hours, make it happen, right? And you can go for the live stream theoretically, as long as you want to, um, like you said, it, it's fine to have that extra two minutes. Right. <laughs> and now my mom is jumping in the comments and saying that she hates one V one matchups. And then in all caps, boring. Uh, we also want to give a shout out to one of the greatest supporters of the Jack's Rudolph podcast. Uh, Miss Jeannie Jones herself, uh, giving a shout out to men's weapons. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> that dog in the profile picture is sitting right down here also. <laughs> that's awesome all right so uh next thing i wanted to talk about one more thing with regard to quebec and i know we've gone off on a bit of a tangent with quebec but uh as a weapons competitor i couldn't help but notice like yeah the lighting looks awesome but i, I wonder if that's messing with anybody and even when you came on stage for sync i, I saw you use an, an old trick of mine that i've taught you of uh before the performance actually starts doing a little release and kind of seeing what the bow looks like in the lights. So that just in case anything happened, it wasn't really before, before your performance started. So it doesn't matter. Right. Uh, so I saw you do that, which means I know you were thinking about it, but tell me about that experience as a weapons competitor. You did two weapons forms up there between sync and then your individual um, was that enhanced lighting that did make the show better. Did it make things a little bit more difficult on you? I definitely thought that it would. And I don't know if it's just because it's just muscle memory and I'm like on autopilot and I don't really, in the moment, I'm not like, this sounds weird, but I'm not just like looking at my bow coming down. I just, I throw it, I do my spins and I catch it where it's supposed to be. So it didn't really affect much. When I was watching, because pretty much the whole show, I would step out onto the side and just kind of watch and feel out the crowd, the atmosphere, the lights and the the smoke, which was crazy too, like the fog and the smoke everywhere. Um, and just like the sound system and, and everything, which was all amazing. But from the side, it looked like it would be a problem kind of. Um, mm -hmm. so I was watching on the side and like, it was like foggy. It was like a cloud of smoke covering the stage. And I'm like, from here, it looks distracting. And then when we went on stage for, um, pretty sure Forms was before Sync and the weapons i got on stage and as i was coming to the side of the stage to walk up so we can walk straight onto the stage which is still such a cool vibe to walk straight on the stage. Uh, walk. from the side yeah 
from the side, it still looked really foggy. And then as I got up there, it looked a little foggy. And as I walked out, it looked completely normal. And mm -hmm. most of the crazy lights, I think, that were like flashing and moving around like crazy were all behind me. Mm -hmm. I think all the ones that were in front were pretty just standard. So I think that's probably what helped a bit. Um, and it didn't, I don't want to say it didn't affect me at all, but it wasn't like a huge deal. Um, and the color of my bow too, it's like that bright yellow on one side and then a gold on the other side. So it's pretty easy to see. The lights actually make it easier to see. So mm -hmm. overall, it wasn't an issue. That's awesome. And that is one thing that I noticed about Quebec. Granted, I never, when I was on stage at Quebec, I never had like the, the multicolor flashing lights. We had the big screen and the big screen would sometimes do like a, a lightning effect or whatever, um, yeah. but nothing like what it was this year. But we would get kind of the, the fog and we would get like the big stage lights. And I almost feel like, because I, I agree with you, I've thought before about like, is, is the fog going to like cloud vision or anything? But it's almost like the fog dampens the stage light just enough to where they kind of cancel each other out and it does feel pretty normal up there. Um, I just didn't know if the if the multicolored extra lights in the background were, were going to have more of an effect um, than what we can tell kind of just sitting at home and watching. Uh, but it's a good thing to hear that it didn't. Um, and, and really, the, the drop rates in the finals were pretty low. Um, I think there was there was one bad bobble in a weapons division, but I don't think I remember any just like overt drops. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think there were a couple, but overall, yeah, it was not that. Oh yeah, Brennan, Brennan, I think Brennan in your division dropped, and then yeah. what seems the one who I was thinking of that had the stumble. But outside of that, you know, there really wasn't much else that went wrong, which is always a good thing. You want everybody to hit their forms in the show. Yeah. I also want to give a shout out to, uh, to Brennan Green with Revolution. Uh, you mentioned his first win in Quebec, but he also won back at Cowboy Up, was on stage in that finals at well, so a new NASCAR tournament on the circuit. Uh, so I want to give him a shout out for making it out of those divisions and, and representing his squad well. Uh, so I think that's all I've got for you on Quebec. And as you guys can imagine, uh, with Ben on the show, anybody that knows me and Ben knows that I have trained this guy since he was eight years old. Uh, ben said on Inside Scoop earlier this week, uh, shout out to the Martial Arts Internet Network and Inside Scoop with Alex and Jeff, uh, that he thinks that he shares half a brain with me. We're going to dive into that. So you guys know that obviously Ben and I are going to get into some more topics than just kind of reflecting on Quebec. So the first thing that I want to talk about is your bow form in general, right? The the most common criticism that, that I hear, because I'm Jackson, so I'm the one who hears this stuff, is I, I hear a ton of people criticizing bow in general and saying, oh, everybody just looks like Jackson now, right? And I do I do see that. When I, when I look at a division, what's funny is a lot of the times it's a bunch of kids that I don't train who have just kind of watched YouTube videos and copied stuff, right? And now maybe they're watching YouTube videos of you and Esteban and copying some of that stuff, which kind of by proxy maybe looks like Jackson a little. But anyway, right? And so that's the most common criticism that I hear. It's like everybody looks the same. Everybody's just doing what Jackson does, right? But one thing I always tell people is if you watch my students, the people who I've actually trained, I actively tell them to not be me. I say, if you, if you want to be better than me, which is my goal for every student that I train, because I want to see the sport continue to move forward, you've got to be different from me. And you're somebody that has done that as well, if not better than everybody else in taking the things that I've taught you, but creating your own style with it. And so I just want you to speak to that a little bit. And, and what do you think your keys are to being able to set yourself apart and, and generate that unique style of bow that is Ben Jones? Mm -hmm. I think one thing is I've I've watched like every bow competitor ever. So <laughs> even I've watched you the most and I've definitely learned the most straight from you. I think just watching so much has, you know, and maybe not from every single video I've watched, but things stick out here and there that have kind of stuck with me or that I've tried to replicate in a way. And then those kind of just end up happening. And so that kind of makes more of like a hybrid style of a lot of different people, probably, um, even though I think my main style is, I guess, your style in a way. But I think some of it is just natural. I don't know if it's body type or just the way I've trained things, maybe slightly different than how you would have trained the same thing. Um, just different angles on swings or the way it comes behind the back into the toss. I think just little mechanics like that 
have just set it apart enough that it just doesn't look quite the same. Um, I think probably the biggest factor is the different moves I've made up myself. And I mean, right now in the form I just did last weekend, I have at least four like staple moves that I've made up. So, I mean, that right there shouldn't look like you if I made them up, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> shouldn't look like anybody else but me. So I think that's huge too. And just being as creative as you can to go outside of what you know and try different things and make up different things. Um, and then what you make up, I think in ways I've taken the same ideas as, as you have, and then just switched little things and it changes it enough mm -hmm. and it makes it you know, unique enough to me that I think it, it has a big impact on not looking exactly like you. Um, but there are still some things when I'm watching my own forms, I'm like, that looked like Jackson for sure. Like <laughs> my main pass, we do the the behind the head tie, and then right into the toss. I was like, yeah, that part looked like Jackson. But that's definitely not a bad thing, you know. <laughs> well, thank you. And and I was gonna piggyback on that and say that there were certainly things in my career that I borrowed from other competitors and made little adjustments to that I look back and I'm like, well, yeah, that does look like the way Billy Ledger did it because I'm trying to do it the way that Billy Ledger did it. That looks kind of like the way that Corey Luckus did it, because I'm trying to do it the way that Corey Luckus did it, because it looked good when he did it that way. You know what I mean? And, and I think that it's, it's the ensemble coming together to look unique is what matters. And I think you hit the nail on the head by saying that it's the tricks, right? At the end of the day, if you add up all the different variations of bow striking, you're probably going to come out to around – 20 to 25 total different variations of, of individual strikes, right? And there's a whole bunch of different ways those can be put together, but there's only a few different ways those can be put together that can match the, the standard of speed in today's competition and that can, can look right to a judge. If your strike combos are too unique or too different, they're going to come out looking funky. And if you look too funky, if you look too unique, then the judges aren't going to be comfortable scoring your way, right? And so when it comes to striking, yes, you can be a, a more creative striker, but that's that alone is not going to set you apart stylistically. Really what makes makes people look unique is what are the big tricks that when somebody watches a form, those are the two or three or four moments that they remember. And so your ability to come up with tricks that other people haven't done before is the thing that sets you apart from your from your competition, right? Or from everybody else that's done both so that you can look unique. I think one other point that I want to bring up just to kind of educate uh, any bow people in the audience here, or really not just bow, but any weapon. Mm -hmm. Personality is everything. Like the personality that you bring to the stage is going to change the perception of your form and the perception of your style, right? Like I am, I am certain that Ben and Esteban could learn the exact same bow form and go on stage and do the exact same bow form, not in sync where they're trying to look alike, that's different, but in a division against each other, they could do the exact same bow form and they would look dynamically different because the way that the two of you carry yourselves, the way that you go about moving the bow or just walking on stage is different. And so the personality of a form, not just bow, but for any weapon or even empty hand, that can kind of transform what is perceived as your style. Any thoughts or reactions to that? Yeah, I definitely agree. And it's funny you mentioned that about, you know, not trying to look the same and just doing your own thing because I don't feel like when I'm doing my sync form with Esteban, I don't feel like I'm like me in a way, which is weird. Cause it's <laughs> like, I feel like I'm me impersonating Esteban. <laughs> and I don't know if you think the same, but um, I mean, the goal is to look the same. So, you know, if I did things, a specific way that I would rather do it in my own form, then it wouldn't look the exact same. So I don't know if that's common or not, but just a little bit of like a stylistic switch from trying to look like Esteban in a way. So we look the exact same and then just not trying anything but to be myself and my own stuff. So. Right. And that's something that Jake and I talked about all the time when we did sync is even even the speed of the form, right? Like Jake and I sync form was not Jackson's full speed. It wasn't Jake's full speed. It was the sync speed. Like it was like the agreed upon, this is the way that we do this form. And, 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 and I, I agree with what you're saying that you don't really feel like yourself when you're doing a sync form, like you, you're actively trying to match the other person. And I, I can even remember like down to the strike combo, 
we had some strike combos in the form that were kind of Jackson strike combos and some strike combos that were kind of Jake strike combos. And I was literally trying to like impersonate the way that Jake moved when trying to do the Jake strike combos. Right. Um, so I think that's a really interesting aspect of the sync division um, that a lot of people just don't realize. And already in the show, we've been name dropping some bow competitors. I went ahead and threw Billy Ledger out there. Uh, and for anybody that follows the Black Belt Magazine articles that I publish, you know that recently I published an article that was near and dear to my heart, which was underrated bow competitors, like the people that I will go on YouTube and watch for hours that not enough people know about because maybe they didn't get you know the, the same number of wins that some of the other guys have gotten or whatever the case may be, and that's what makes them underrated. So, Ben, I wanted to pick your brain a little bit. Obviously, there were the five that I mentioned in that article. Let's see if I can remember them off the top of my head. Talked about Ross Levine, who is arguably not underrated because he does have some of those big wins, but his fighting just makes people forget about it, right? Uh, Micah Carnes, Billy Ledger, Connor Griffith, and Nate Andrade were the five that, like, these these dudes don't get enough love, right? Uh, number one, do you agree with that list? which gives you the out if you don't have anybody to add. Uh, but really, if there's anybody else that like you get on YouTube and you're like, yeah, I watch this person all the time and they don't get nearly the credit they deserve. Uh, who are some of the underrated bow competitors like that in your opinion? Uh, I do agree. I don't want to say I agree exactly like mm -hmm. the exact same that there's no one else I would add. Um, but... <laughs> For those of you that can hear that, that's Macy. That's Ben's dog. Who knows what she's doing? Okay. She was dreaming. She good? Yeah, she's good. She was dreaming? <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're good. Hilarious. Anyway, yes. Um, 100% Connor, Connor Griffith, is one of my favorites all time to watch. And I know he had, like, some, some wins and some stage appearances and stuff, but not as many as he should have. Um, yeah, and then I, I agree with pretty much everybody else. Um, I don't know, because I wasn't around when they were competing, so I don't actually really know how many wins or whatever they would have, but I feel like Corey Lutkiss doesn't get talked about enough. Mm. Um, and maybe the same, and same thing, I'm not exactly sure, because I don't know how the, the divisions actually played out results-wise, but Joey Greenhall, too, with just mm. the, the different strikes and the way he – just went about the whole form. I think overall, just as a mindset, is kind of underrated how he treated the bow forms and things like that. So yeah, I, I do agree with the list, and I I looked at it when it came out like a couple weeks ago or whatever, and I was like, it's a good list. And then um, <laughs> those, those two guys came to mind. I was like, I don't know how underrated you could consider them, but I feel like they they deserve a mention there too. Yeah, I agree that Joey Greenhall absolutely was underrated. Um, but he did like, he got on Paul Mitchell, granted it was primarily as a point fighter, but he did some bow forms on Paul Mitchell. Right. So you can make that as an argument. Like if you were on Paul Mitchell, were you really underrated? You know what I mean? Like, so there's that aspect of it, but absolutely. I considered him. I think I mentioned Brandon Ballou in the article, even though he wasn't one of the top five, which Brandon Ballou was like the, my age, Joey Greenhall, because obviously there was a bunch of Joey influence in Brandon Ballou. Um, uh -huh. so I think that style of bow is awesome. And yes, if you are a, a present day sport karate fan and you hear me saying Brandon Ballou no he is not just a tough heavyweight point fighter he had a mean bow form back in the junior division and I, it frustrates me that he won't do it in the adult division and I keep telling him to do it just because I want to see it again but that's beside the point um, so Joey Greenhall I would agree would, would fall in that underrated category Corey, I obviously have a ton of respect for Corey, but wouldn't put him as underrated specifically because of all of the wins that he got. You mentioned that you weren't around yet, uh, but when I was kind of first becoming a known competitor when I was 12, 13 years old, um, you know, kind of when I made when we made that transition from the Premier Martial Arts National Karate Team to change the game around that era. Um, Corey Lutkus was dominating 14 to 17 weapons. Like every night show, it was going to be Corey Lutkus winning uh, CMX weapons, and it was going to be Nikki Stanley winning CMX forms. Like that was that was what the 14 to 17 year old night shows were like at, at like 2011 ish time frame. Um, so Corey, I mean, he literally had had a year where I think he won probably nine or 10 of the 12 or 13 overalls. I mean, he was that consistent. Won the U.S. Open that year. I don't remember who won the Warrior Cup. Maybe he wasn't 
Yeah. He might not have been there or something. Might, he may have dropped or something. I don't, I don't remember exactly how that shook out. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> now, now my mom's giving Corey some love in the comments. Yeah, Corey, Corey was awesome. Um, I remember, I'll tell a quick story because Ben, I think you'll enjoy this. Um, so 2009, rewinding a couple of years, um, I was not huge on NASCAR yet. Um, made stage at the Diamonds in 2008 uh, for traditional forms. So like people knew that I was a bow guy, but I wasn't like the bow guy yet in like 2008, 2009. But Corey was the bow guy at that time. And uh, we were on the WKA. I got to think about it because they switched to WKU, but back then it was WKA. Um, the WKA World Championship team that competed in Spain in 2009, which I've talked about this team on the show before. Roster was stacked, right? It was me, a young me, um, Sammy Smith, Amanda Chin, uh, Gabby Wolf, and then moving up in age, Corey Lutkus, Nikki Stanley, Matt Immig, uh, Jarrett Liker, Becca Ross. Uh, I know I'm forgetting people too. Uh, but the Nick Schneider, Nick Schneider did sync with Corey at the WK World, right? You've probably seen that form before. Uh, so, like, it was a crazy roster showing up to the WK Worlds. And I remember um, that Worlds is where I kind of, like, figured out the Orbiter. And we were doing, like, a Team USA training session. Uh, we were just, like, running through sections together and whatever. And, uh, and I threw the Orbiter in one of the training sessions. And I remember Corey being like, yo, what was that? And, uh, you know, the orbiter for the people watching, Ben, I know you know this, but the throw that's from behind the back bow kind of travels up floating around the body, you reach and catch it on the other side of the neck. Uh, and so Corey like saw it and freaked out about it. I was like, Hey Corey. And I don't know where I got this confidence as like a, a 10 year old or 11 year old or whatever I was. Um, uh, but I was like, I, I had to have been like 12 anyway. Uh, but I was like, Hey Corey, I bet if I, if I let you try 10 of them, you don't catch one of them. And he was like, <laughs> okay, bet. And so Corey did 10 of them and didn't catch any of them because, I mean, it's a brand new move. I mean, what do you expect, right? No matter how good you are, if you've never seen something before, it's going to be hard to catch it in your first 10 tries. Uh, but then what was crazy was, was that several months later, I think it would have been like September, um, Corey tried the move on stage at Twin Towers. So like the guy that had been dominating weapons all of a sudden saw my move and then he tried it on stage at Twin Towers. Uh, he wound up messing it up. So he wasn't the first person that did it in competition. I, I still I still got to have those bragging rights. Oh, yeah. uh, but like to see him go for it, I was like, yo, that's crazy. Like that was Corey going for my move, you know? And it, it was a totally a respect thing. It wasn't, because back then like biting was a thing. Like people get called out for biting people's moves. Nobody does that anymore, which I think that we probably should keep doing that or whatever. Um, but it wasn't like that. Like it was all respect because it was like little, like at the time I was a nobody and Corey, like throwing one of my moves, you know what I'm saying? Um, so that was really cool. The, the worlds would have been in October. So it was like September of that next year. So he like worked on it and like actually put it into a form, which was pretty cool. Uh, but anyway, so that was, that was a big tangent. Uh, but now we'll get, we'll get back on track here. Let's see. I definitely okay. So now, now is where I want to dive into the comment that you made on Inside Scoop about about Sharon half the brain, uh, primarily just because I thought it was funny. I think I see where you're coming from, but I think that like not everybody like makes that connection right away, right? Uh, so I just want to give you a chance to talk about that a little bit more. Number one, because it's a hilarious comment, and number two, because I do think there's a lot of truth to it. And I've told students before that like. You know, we're like, hey, I know that you're busy with med school, like need to get a, like an extra lesson here or there. I'm like, yeah, like go see go see one of my guys because my guys think the way that I think. You know what I mean? Uh, so, Ben, tell me a little bit um, about what you meant by that comment and, and kind of explain it to the audience here. Sure. I think it's probably mainly because you've molded my brain to with so much knowledge <laughs> that, you know, it's just. Everything. Yeah, it just is what it is. <laughs> like all the all the videos you've told me to watch, and then you know, obviously we're looking at the same things, and then for some reason we're like thinking the same things about the things we're looking at. Like, you know, you can just kind of tell. Like, we see we see it. You know, um, when I said that, I think I think after the podcast, um, when I said it, mom was like, "Well, it's funny because when you would be like in lessons with Jackson." downstairs and she would be listening um she would say like we were we were talking about stuff and she was so lost and then i would just like answer it right before you would say it and then it was like 
we were just on like the same page, you know, and she was so confused. And so I was like, what do you mean? It's just like, you know, whatever it was that we're talking about. It's like, yeah, when you orbit her, it goes around your body, you catch it over here and blah, 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 whatever it was. And, um, and she was like, yeah, that's not normal. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. Well, and I guess we're just kind of like on the same wavelength. I don't know. Um, yeah, I just like the way I think it's probably mainly because you've taught me like the philosophy of basically everything sport karate. So the way I look at things is what you've taught me. So therefore, it's like pretty much the same. Hmm. Uh, so I think it's more of is your fault that <laughs> brain is the same. Um, and then you basically made it and filled it up with all your knowledge, you know. Well, I, I appreciate the praise and I, I will accept the, the responsibility for forever corrupting your mind with all of the uh, the Jackson Rudolph sport karate opinions. Right. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I just wanted to dive into that a little bit more because that was like a highlight of that podcast for me. And by the way, uh, I know typically Inside Scoop and I don't normally have the same guest on the show in a week. It just kind of happened that way organically this time. Uh, so definitely want to give a shout out to them. And after we finish this live stream, if y'all haven't seen the episode of Inside Scoop yet, head on over to Martial Arts Inner Network and, and give that a watch because Ben was also dropping a lot of knowledge um, in that episode as well. Um, another thing that I want to talk about, we've been talking about Bo. We're certainly going to get back to Bo, as anybody tuning into this was going to expect. I want to talk about creative forms for a moment because watching the last couple of tournaments in particular, Ocean States and then at Quebec, I've noticed that you've got one of the best creative forms on the circuit. Um, and, and I love the fact that it seems like in that men's division right now, it seems to be you and Rashad kind of going back and forth. Rashad wanted at Ocean States, you wanted at Quebec. And, and I love the stylistic differences. Rashad's is very like some of the slaps, like the elbow slaps and everything that he has in that form, just like they go crazy. And then obviously his like trademark intensity and everything that, that the Black Mamba brings to a form, right? Um, contrasted with your uh, slightly different approach, right? That isn't so much of the over the top power performance and all that but you're just going to go out there and be just as technically sound as anybody in the game you know what i mean like the extension of your chops and punches the the pointed toes on the jump front kick which i know is maybe controversial but that is a standard of cleanliness in today's sport right um but like down to every little detail of those techniques looking super clean right so tell us a little bit about kind of your keys to success in that division what do you value in a creative form I, i've probably kind of set you up with what your answer is going to be here uh but i've got some follow-up questions and and i want to hear it from the horse's mouth it's just all the basics i mean especially with i think what people look at now with extreme and musical is it's very tricking focused and in creative you i mean really can't have that so you know, some people push it more and kind of try to make it more tricking or base in a way. Um, I don't know. I guess I like the more, I guess, old school approach now. Um, and I've actually took it a lot of influence and, and watched a lot of old videos of just open hand forms, whether it was a creative specific form or even an extreme form that I've pulled different hand things from or whatever. Um, but yeah, just some of the concepts and stuff are all simple, probably like... 90% of forms competitors in all of NASCA could do the form. Like there's nothing super difficult in it. Um, it's just, yeah, technical and it's all, but it's all basics. Um, just trying to make them as good as they can be. And yeah, the kicks are a big part of it too. I think I've always enjoyed kicks, even when it was just in like in trad forms, if there's like just a snap front kick and it's, you know, not even like head height, just like a chest height or belt height, even kick. I've just liked kicks you know pretty much my whole career i never did it in weapons because i think i have just a different view of like i think weapons should be based on the weapon um and then like forms obviously you need to add in kicks and um obviously bring the hands as well so yeah i've made some adjustments over the last uh well since i decided to do forms at ocean states and i've always kind of done it here and there i did it in promac a lot um but NASCAR, I just never did well. I think because I wasn't as tricking focused when the rest of my division was, like as a junior and everything. So they were kind of set apart. Now, though, I like how the creative forms division is looking in the men's division overall mm -hmm. because we don't have a bunch of people doing borderline illegal moves and getting away with it. You know, everybody's following the rules really well um, for our division, at least right now. 
And, you know, I like that. I don't like when there's a creative forms division and it's just who can push the boundaries the most and that person ends up winning because they do the most difficulty, which, yep. um, yeah, whatever. But I like, so I like how the men, the men are doing it right now. Um, I guess, including myself and we all, you know, we, we all respect each other. And we were talking about it in Quebec too. We're like, so I think Rashad was trying to do a cheat 720s form. And Esteban, who wasn't even in the division, was like, <laughs> oh, I don't think you can do that. And I don't know if he was trying to like, help me out or if, he, if he's just you know having fun with Rashad I don't really know but I was like no you can definitely do that like <laughs> I've done it in creative forms there's, there's 360 in the air that's the rule so you know we were all saying like if you do a cheat seven in your form I'm not gonna say anything and Brennan and he's like yeah I don't care and it's like it, it should be legal anyway it doesn't matter that's the problem right like it's it shouldn't be the competitor's responsibility to like be policing each other and looking for like what's legal and what's not like that is a judge's responsibility is to be able to know what is legal and what's not. And the problem is, I think that if we, and, and this is, this is a hypothesis. Okay. But I think that if we pulled every judge at a tournament, right? Like if we showed up at Battle of Atlanta and said, Hey, every judge that is currently sitting in a judge's chair, open survey monkey. And I want you to fill out this poll cheat 720 in creative legal or illegal. I think you would see scary close to a 50 50 because you would have some judges actually you might see more like a 70 30 in favor of illegal because i think that there's a lot of judges that would see the the the, the number 720 and then immediately assume it's illegal but they don't realize that when you do a cheat 720 the cheat in front of it means that you're doing most of the rotation on the ground and then it is truly only a 360 in the air which by the nasca definition means that the technique is legal right and there would be judges that would recognize that i'm not saying that all judges don't know that but i'm saying there's a lot of judges who are misguided by tricking terminology which dan perez can agree with me tricking terminology other than tkt is for the most part ridiculous right right uh, because TKT is the actual, like, no, this is how much rotation you're doing. We're not going to do, we're not going to call it a 1080 and it actually only be a 720 or whatever the case may be. We're actually going to call it by the amount of rotation being done, which doesn't help the creative rule any, right? Yeah. Uh, but the, the segue that I want to take here is if you were rewriting the rule, forget what the NASCAR rule says about the 360, about the inversions, forget all of that, Right. If you were writing the rule, and, I, and you don't have to put it into like actual rule format, right? What moves, if you were to make a list, what moves in creative forms do you think should be legal moves? And what moves do you feel like should be illegal? And what is kind of that, that cutting point so that there's not a gray area in the middle like there currently is? Sure. I wish I could say if there's a kick on it, it can count. But that... The way tricking is nowadays, that would not work because then you have shuriken cutters being thrown and you have snafu swipes. Like, so that wouldn't work. Um, I think if you could go like, and everybody would have to understand it, but if you could say um, all vert kicks and you have to be up and down, not even like slanted somewhere in the middle, like you have to be up and down, you know, if you lean a little bit, whatever, but like a pop 720 hook, like an old school, just step into it, pop 720 hook. Like, I think, why would that not be allowed? Like, it's mm. it's not a flip. You add a kick on it. Yeah, you spin a little bit, but, oh, well, everybody can spin, so <laughs> oh, why not add it in there? Um, and, yeah, and then I think if we could go by the true kick terminology, like you're saying, the TKT, it would make things easier, too. Um, because you go, instead of, is cheat 720 legal if you're pulling people, you go, is cheat 360 hook legal? And then, yes, of course it is, you know? And I even mentioned that to Rashad. I'm like, dude, it's not a cheat 720. It's a cheat 360 hook. So there's no argument there. Like, you really break down what it is. Who cares? Um, right. Yeah, I think if it's very vert kick focused, that would work. And then you still have butterflies and things. I'm not sure. I was how gonna ask, would, would you say that illusion twist, which is a horizontal rotation with the, the big crescent kick at the end, right? For those watching at home, Ben, I know you know what it is. Um, 
would that be an exception or do you think that doesn't belong in creative? Um, I, I'm okay with it. I actually accidentally did one on stage. <laughs> 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 Luckily I stuck it, but I set up, cause I like to do my butterflies really like low and fast. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I'm like, he just did a shuriken cutter and a D leg twist and I'm about to do a butterfly kick. So I was like, the least I can do is illusion twist here. And so literally as I'm dipping down to go into it, I'm like, yeah, I'm a twist. And then I go, boom. And I luckily stuck it, but it was like super low and the kick wasn't as big as I could have done it because I wasn't ready for it. But um, I, I like illusion twists because you're really not that horizontal when you do them. You have to get your chest back up. So you start horizontal like a butterfly, obviously, but your chest gets back up. There's a kick on the end of it. Um, so I like illusion twists. B twist and B twist round gets weird because if it's just a B twist, if you do it well, then you're horizontal, which is pushing it. Some people are a little more naturally inverted on B twists, so that's really pushing it. And then there's there's no kick out of it. And I think if we're making a creative rules focused, you know, or creative focus rule book or whatever feel like maybe not every move you do has to have a kick on it, but there should be kicks, you know. Um, but then you go B-twist round, you now have a kick, and naturally most people's B-twist round, their chest comes up. So right. then you have... It has to to throw the kick, right. Exactly. So then it's a little more, like, valid. Like, you could almost let that pass. Mm -hmm. But it still is very tricking-like. Right. So here, here's how I see it, because I think we need to make it as, as simple as possible. And I used to be somebody who was of the opinion, I don't care what you do as long as there's a kick at the end of it, right? Like I used to be of that opinion. I publicized that opinion. And then people were like, Jackson, you're crazy. Then what are you going to do when people do shuriken cutters? And I'm like, you know what? That's probably a pretty good point. Um, so I, I, have, I have evolved. I have changed my opinion on this. Um, and I've also changed my opinion because I think that the butterfly and all of the moves thereafter creates a really, really confusing component. It, it actually, in my opinion, makes up probably 75% of the creative forms gray area, right? Number one, butterflies are overused. Like if you're doing a wushu butterfly in your creative form, there's no problem with that, but so is everybody else and their cousin. Like you don't really need a wushu butterfly in your form to win because literally everybody's doing one unless you have one that is like beautiful like uh, you have a really good one. Philip Brumet has a really good one. Like unless it's like a beautiful wushu butterfly, then like it's really not adding a whole lot, right? Uh, but where I was going with that is, is that butter knife, for example, a butterfly with a hook kick at the end. I cannot tell you in creative forms how many people I have seen do a butter knife in which their head goes below their waist and it really looks like an aerial that they just kind of fling a hook kick out there at the end yeah. of, Right. And it's and uh, a lot of times people do like butter knife to split. And for some reason, they invert it even more when they do it that way. And it's right. like, well, hold on. Forget any rotation. You are straight up inverting. But then if anybody tries to arbitrate for it, you're going to say, no, no, it was a butter knife. And it's like, no, like that's not it's not about what you call the move. And so that's where I'm at on this rule. I'm like, we need to eliminate the terminology altogether. The rule be based purely on the amount of rotation. I like your idea of keeping it vertical and illusion twist, B twist round. We don't need them in creative. They're not going to dynamically change the outcome of divisions. So let's just not have, them. just make them illegal, right? Make it easier to understand for the judges and for the competitors. Um, and just make it so that, like you said, straight up spinning kicks. You want to do two spins. Great. You want to do three spins. Great. But it has to be straight up. There can't be any angle of the body, right? beyond a certain degree, right? You know what I mean? I mean, if somebody does this a little bit on their, you know, 720, who cares, right? right? Uh, but like, you can't be going up there and doing a cork that you just don't invert, like a cork round or something like that. You can't do that, right? Um, but anyway, so we're, we're probably letting this drag on a little bit, but I, I agree in principle that focus on kicking is really important. And I think that we, we have to avoid terminology in the rule and just make it about judge. What do you see? Do you see their head go below their hips? Yes or no. Doesn't matter what they call it. If their head goes below their hips while they're in the air, it's a disqualification, right? I think that's the simplest way to do it. And then after that, us competitors can get together and work on a list of like, hey, this is what the rule says. What can we all agree on fits this list? 
What can we all agree on? These are the things that we can do so that we don't have these awkward moments at tournament where everybody's sitting around like, did you see what he did? I don't know if that's legal because that's all like, it, it's just toxic and it makes the creative forms division worse. And we, we don't want that to happen because we have so many good competitors in creative forms like now, like you and Rashad in the juniors, go back to warrior cup. Philip and Avery Presley made it to the Warrior Cup finals, both with creative forms on either side of that. They won those overalls with creative forms to get to that Warrior Cup round, right? Like that, that tells you that something's working in creative. Yeah, definitely. Uh, even watching Avery's form this past weekend, she had like nothing over or, or more difficult than like a tornado kick. But the tornado kick she did was like flared out so it was like this kicks way up here her bottom leg straight and it just looks so much prettier than just doing a tornado kick into like whatever else like a tornado right. kick like if you just snap that tornado kick out and then that's that was her like whole pass it was like autobahn tornado snapped it out and then like kept moving right away and it was like simple but to do it that well was just like oh man that looks nice and that's what creative should be about, right? Like yep. being able to do those simple skills and do them exceptionally well. That's the whole point of creative. Mm -hmm. Because one thing, and, and I'm not, I'm not going to do any name drops here, but I heard when, when I started talking about some recommendations that I would have for the creative rules and saying, I don't care how many times you spin, as long as you throw a kick. A concern that I heard from promoters was that, well, wait a minute, in our mind, in the mind of some promoters, the creative forms division was designed so that somebody who doesn't train tricking all the time that just goes to their local, you know, martial arts school and wants to try doing a creative form that they can conceivably compete in that division. Maybe they can't do a backflip. So they literally can't go and do extreme, right. Or do extreme and be any kind of competitive, but creative is a place where you don't have to train tricking. And if you just come from your local martial arts school, that is a division that you can potentially thrive in. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I understand that point because what is the promoter's number one focus right now? How do we attract more people to our tournament? And so if you want to attract more people to the tournament, you got to give them divisions they can compete in instead of saying, well, yeah, here's all these creative divisions, but you got to be able to trick to do these. So good luck. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I, I do, I do understand that. And, and I, and I appreciate that, which is why I think it's important to have this dialogue about, well, what, what is really the most fair um, in terms of uh, the creative forms rules, I got distracted by one of my mom's comments. Is she? Uh, she may or may not be trying to start some drama in the chat here. Oh, no. um, so well, we're already going to be running a little bit long on this show, but I, I could have told anybody that was coming from a mile away when I haven't been on the show. Um, so I do want to talk about sync. I had a number of questions lined up about sync that we're not going to dive into all the details of, um, and I think you you went through your sync life uh, pretty extensively on the inside scoop with Alex and Jeff. Um, yeah. So I want to summarize it with this. You played a game on that show uh, where you were kind of like having to rank a few like uh, sync teams that they threw out there for you. Pretty difficult to do some of that, but I want to, yeah. I want to remix it. I want to give you a different sync based question just so that we can cover the sync topic. Who are some competitors and maybe just come up with like two or three pairs, right? Yeah. Who are some competitors that never did sync together whether it was because they competed in the same era and they just didn't do it or they just weren't on the same team, or even they were just from different eras. So it would have been impossible for them to have done it together. But if we could time travel, right? Like what are some athletes like that, that if you put together would have been crazy in the sync division? Hmm. Yeah. A few come up and I, I actually just thought of this. I don't know why I didn't think of it before. But Dawson and Kalman, the way Dawson has progressed so much in the last couple years under Kalman, you know, since he started working with him. That single would sword be, or double sword, though? Single sword or double sword? I think single sword would just be so That's what I'm That's what I'm yeah. yeah. Which they could do double, too, I'm sure. But I just think, like, a really, really good single sword sink would just be so cool to see. Yeah. Um, I love that. Yeah. So that would be one. Um, me and my mom were talking about this and obviously I would love it. She said, me and you, I think she made a comment on that on one of the posts that that was somewhere, you know, um, it's like, you know, I'm down for if you, if you want to do it. But, yeah. If I, if I ever make a comeback and if Jake's tired of me, maybe, maybe we can make something like that happen or maybe, yeah. Hey, maybe I'll just jump cool. in with you and Esteban and we'll just do a, uh, do a little three-way. 
I thought about that too. I was gonna say, you never know. Um, yeah, I think anything's that was would... possible. Anything's possible. Anything. Anyway, yeah. There's no. There's no telling what we just started by me saying that. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think you know the styles maybe don't match up the best, but I think Matt and Rudy would be cool to see, just to see what they could come up with. Because okay. like their forms, I know Rudy is very known as the comma guy, but his forms were very nice too. Yeah. Like. And obviously, Matt's probably the, the greatest all time at forms. So, putting them two together, I think, would be cool. Even though there's a, a pretty bit of a stylistic change, I still think it'd be sweet. Mm -hmm. uh, same with Matt and Mark, I think, would be pretty cool. Ooh, wow. that's interesting. Which is, I know they were like kind of head to head, but I think it'd be cool to see. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, I'll, I'll throw a few at you just because I was I was mulling over this a little bit as well. So kind of on the same theme as like a, a current and a, and, a, and a more like previous generation or old school, like you mentioned me and you or like Dawson and Kalman. One that just stylistically, these dudes move identical. Like if you put their form side by side, the way they jump, the way they cut, the way they yell, you probably already know what I'm going to say. Tyler Weaver and Alex Mancius are like carbon copies of each other. Yeah. Like they, they do commas the same way, you know, and, and I don't really, it's crazy how it happened. Right. Cause if you look at Rudy, like you can see some of Rudy and Tyler, but it, it doesn't look the same. Yeah. And if you look at Rudy's students, Tyler Kinsey, they don't look the same. Right. Yeah. But somehow in that lineage, like the jump between Tyler and Alex is like, they somehow like just they move the same. I, I can't describe it any differently than that. They, they move exactly the same. Um, so Tyler and Alex, just because of how similar they are, I think would match up really well. Um, another one that's kind of like two people that went against each other, but I think a sync form would have been crazy and they were never on the same team. Steve Tirada and Kim Doe. I think a, I think a Steve Tirada and Kim Doe sync would be so unique. Like the, the type of tricking they would put in that thing would just be out of this world. They can both dance. So there'd probably be like some element of break dancing in the tricking combo. So that's another one that I thought would be dope. Um, and then as far as Bo goes, um, I think a couple of like 2000s Hakama guys, I would have loved to have seen like Billy Ledger and Corey Lutkus together. I think that would have been pretty sick. Um and then also, like, I would have loved to have gone back in time and done a sync form with Corey. You know what I'm saying? Like, some of the stuff, some of the stuff that Corey and I could have done in like 2012 would be like some of the stuff that people do today. You know what I'm saying? Like, at that time, we were the ones innovating bow tricks, and so we would have been like so ahead of the curve, so to speak, that some of the stuff that we could have done together would have been pretty crazy. <laughs> Um, but that's that's just another one that I would throw out there. And then, of course, me getting to do sync with some some of my younger guys, obviously you, Esteban. Um, I got to do it with Jake for years and years, which was really special. Um, but, of course, you know, being able to, to come back and do something like that at some point might would be cool. Um, but anyway, and then my mom's throwing in another comment. My mom's all over the comment section today. And then, oh, okay. So she wants to do – she, she, this is like a team demo slash, uh, I, I guess this is a team demo idea, but she has this like fever dream that we can get like Mike Bernardo to put on a uniform and then get like Casey, Lauren, Becca Ross, me, Jake, you and Esteban, like everybody, like all of the key, pull Wayne Douglas out of retirement, right? Like do like the full lineage and like do a team demo with like the full lineage, which would go crazy, but it's never going to happen like ever. Um, a team sync with Matt, Danny, and Sammy would be pretty cool. My mom's throwing that in the comments too. Uh, obviously, Matt and Danny happened. Danny and Sammy happened in forms, but seeing all three of them do chucks together would be pretty dope. Um, so, like seeing those lineages match up, Rudy, Tyler, and Alex together. Throw in Kenzie with that. Throw in Valera on top of all that, right? Like th there are some lineage like demos or syncs that could be that could be pretty gnarly. Um, so kind of sticking on so there, there's there's one more like main topic that i want to get to before we get to some of the games that's probably going to turn this into an hour and a half show instead of just an hour show but hey you got you guys are getting overtime today okay I appreciate it. so uh one more serious topic that i wanted to get to that's related to the whole sync thing because i wanted to talk a little bit more about your sync partners esteban dawson but uh, i, I want to wrap it up um, more by just talking generally about something that I feel like is so special 
about this current Paul Mitchell squad uh, mm-hmm. and the camaraderie this team has, right? It doesn't surprise me in the slightest because four of you of, of the new gen, right, came from Competitive Edge and were already teammates. You know, the three boys already all best friends. So it's not surprising to me that the chemistry is like it is. Uh, but it is, I mean, I, I've been involved with this team for over 10 years now, and the camaraderie is at a level that I've never seen it at before. And I was on the team with best friends. You know what I mean? Yeah. So speak a little bit to that and how special that is to not just be on the team that you guys all wanted to be on for so long, but for it to be knock on wood working so well. <laughs> I think, well, kind of what you just said is we've all wanted to be on it for so long. I think is a huge part of it because I mean, yeah, like you said, like, I mean, me, Esteban and Dawson are like a weird set of brothers now. And then Avery's like a little sister basically at this point. So um, obviously that was just, you know, nothing changed there. We've just grown. I think our relationships have grown even more from going from competitive edge to Paul Mitchell. But like everybody else who's been added, I think also we didn't have like, I shouldn't say we, cause I wasn't on the team at the time. Paul Mitchell only had like the three competitors. And then all of a sudden, you know, no one's been really active on the team because of COVID. I mean, no one's been active in general, but then all of a sudden you get six competitors at once. And it's like, well, that's huge. We're all in the same situation. Like, I don't want to say none of us were like big superstars because we all had our wins and we we were building the resumes and everything. But none of us were like winning every single thing every single time. And then we all got put on and it's like, man, we I think we all understand how big of an honor it is too. like all of us that are on the team right now we get like the legacy of it. We understand the history and everything. So to be able to represent the name, I think means so much to everybody on the team right now that we're all just living it up and we're loving every single minute of it. Um, And it's like pretty much you took, you know, obviously Jake, Danny, or not Danny, if he comes back, Danny, yeah. Um, Like Sammy, Haley, um, Alex were kind of there already. And then you add basically like nine people, you know, within a year, like a whole new team. And we're all just love to be on the team. We've gotten really close over the last year, everybody. Um, Like you've mentioned a lot, just being able to room with, you know, whoever we get to room with really grows. I mean, just over the weekend, I stayed with Jake Muick. And obviously he's one of the newer guys on. And we had an awesome time. I did not know how much sport karate knowledge he had. Like, <laughs> he, he told me, he was like, yeah, weren't you the first to, like, win your mascot division, your runoff and your grand all at the same tournament? I'm like, why do you know that? That's crazy. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. And he was like, yeah, Atlanta 2018, right? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> That's next level. Yeah. So he's like, you know, and he's like two years younger than me. He's like, you know. He, he just knows everything. And, like, he surprised me so many times with, like, this forms of weapons knowledge over the weekend, too. Um, so, yeah, I think we all just get it. And we, we really appreciate the opportunity to represent the team. And, uh, yeah, we, we got a really good group right now. Yeah, and I couldn't be more proud of you guys. And, you know, as you guys know on the show, I will I will never, ever totally pull open the curtain as far as Paul Mitchell goes. But I will – peek through the curtain a little bit and give you guys little snippets. And, you know, one thing that it was mentioned on the the Inside Scoop uh, show with Alex and Jeff, um, and Alex talks about how a few years ago, I think it was pre-pandemic Chicago, uh, they were doing the interviews and asking like, hey, like who, who are some of the like up and coming, like who's the next big thing that we should talk to? And Alex talked about how I told him, oh, go talk to Ben Jones, right? Uh, what's funny is how similar some of those conversations were when it came to the the pickups last April, because as you mentioned, like none of you, obviously you all had your wins and you'd all earned respect on competitive edge and you had ISKs under your belts and you had resumes there. Don't get me wrong. The resumes were there, Uh, but it wasn't like, you know, picking up Kalman back 10 years ago when he had, you know, won every overall for two seasons and then got on the team or me when I won every overall for two seasons and then got on the team. Right. It it wasn't, it wasn't like that. Like it had been the the previous decade. And, you know, in in a lot of those conversations um, again, without revealing too much, it was no watch, 
Just watch. Watch what's going to happen. Uh, and then all of that has been proven, right? If yeah. we look at every men's CMX weapons overall grand championship this year um, at, you know, the events that you guys have been at, I don't think any of you were at Cowboy Up, but all the other events that you guys have been at, it has been either Dawson or you or Esteban every single time winning that CMX grand, right? The yeah. traditional grand has been a Paul Mitchell men's competitor every single time that they've been in attendance, be it Jake or Esteban Dawson's typically in that grand as well. Right. Like, so the, the hold on and watch has been extremely effective because ever since, and same thing with like Avery and Bella taking advantage of that opportunity. I don't know how many double overall senior grand Sam's won. It's, it's like a million of them. Um, and then, you know, of course, Gabrielle came on after that, but speaking to her addition to the team, same thing, winning some overalls. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a new era for the team. Um, and, and it's really special to just see you guys doing your thing and, and loving doing it together so much. And uh, I couldn't couldn't be more proud of you guys. It's really the, the best way to to wrap that up and, and put it together. Yeah. So as we get to the end of the show, as everybody knows, when we get near the end of the Jack's Rudolph podcast, we got to play a few games. They're always fan favorites. Uh, we're going to try to keep everything in less than 20 to 30 minutes here, but we'll see how that goes. Um, so the first game that I wanted to play and kind of in speaking about some of the Paul Mitchell stuff, because that was another thing when you were on the inside scoop earlier this week, I noticed that there were some questions about like, Hey, is there ever any like pressure from the coaching staff? And you know, that kind of thing. Right. Uh, and so because, again, like I said, we're never going to open the curtain, but we'll, we'll give you little peeks through the curtain. Right? Okay? Uh, what I want is we're going to play a rapid reaction game where I'm going to say some names. Okay? And we're going to have kind of two different categories here. The first category is like JPM. And the second category is like people that you know like more closely and personally. Um, but for the first category, all this is is I'm going to say a name and then in one or two words, just like your immediate response. What do you think of when I say these names? Okay. First one, Coach Rodriguez. The best hugs. <laughs> That's a good one. He does give the best hugs. Absolutely. Chris Raffold. Ooh. Uh, I'd say generous. Ooh, okay. All right. A kind soul. I like that. Steve Babcock. <laughs> Bro. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, the number one word in his vocabulary. And Coach Damon. Passionate. Passionate. Okay. See, so right there, right, the, the, the words that we got were best hugs, generous, bro, and passionate, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like that. that is the rapid reaction to the coaching staff. So I know that sometimes because of the logo and because of the prestige and because it's Paul Mitchell, people think, oh, the coach is big and scary, right? right? No, no. I mean, like, yes, Damon's passion sometimes makes Coach Gilbert a little scary, but that's a good thing. That's a good thing. You see what I'm saying? Like, you know, and, and honestly, if you if you see like Coach Rodriguez get mad, then he can get scary too. But that, that's beside the point, right? Um, and, and people from back in the day know that, right? Um, but it, I, the reason I wanted to do that little activity is just to give that little sneak peek and show people that like, especially when you're a member of the team, like this is all family. Like there's no, there's no intimidation. There's no like, yes, there's expectations to perform, but it's not like somebody's breathing down your neck. Like you better go win this overall. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like it's not that it's not toxic <laughs> is the best way to put it. Uh, but anyway, so now next one, and this is the one that's going to be more, more of just the personal one. So you can probably predict some of these that might be coming. Uh, and we got a few people in the chat, same thing, rapid reaction, one or two words each. And we're going to go somebody who just had a birthday yesterday. Happy birthday, mom. Miss Kathy. Mm, demo queen. <laughs> Good one. I know she's going to appreciate that. Yep. Winston. Oh, man. <laughs> a oh, lot man. Of two words. <laughs> no, no. I, I thought of a lot of different words. Um, For those watching at home, Winston's his brother, by the way. Yes, yes, yes. So probably people pleaser. We were just at his graduation. <laughs> he, you know, he did the fake trip and then he did like a dance at his own graduation in front of a bunch of people. Yeah. Everybody. Was, was it a gritty? No, it was the stinky leg. Oh, it was. Oh, okay. All right. That, that sounds very, that sounds very Winston. James. <laughs> yeah. okay. um, next one. We're going to go for your other brother, Brandon. Uh, funniest guy I know. 
<laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> more than one or two words. But... All right. And then I got two more for you. You know, these are coming. Mom. Mm -hmm. Caring. It's a good thing for a mom to be. I yeah. like that. And dad. Mm -hmm. Driven or hard worker. Mm. Okay. I respect that. And now, obviously, I know that it's hard to like say something to mom and dad in just one or two words. So I'm also going to give you the opportunity, any shout out, any appreciation you want to give uh, your parents for obviously everything they've done to help you on this journey. You have the floor to say a little thank you to them. For sure. Yeah, I mean, obviously, none of it happens without them, you know. Um, yeah, I'm sitting at my dad's desk right now back home, actually, and just like looking around, there's pictures of us everywhere, and, you know. We got, we all did a demo together, like when we were at Premiere uh, for, uh, I think a black belt test or graduation or something. So that's cool. You know, dad ended up, you know, getting his black belt, like actually not with us. I didn't test at the same time. He got his black belt and we were all kind of training at the same time. So that was really cool. Um, obviously they're always there, you know, when, when they can be. Getting to go because mom won't fly. So getting to go to the tournaments like with just dad. <laughs> Got some funny stories from all of those. Um, it's always a fun time. Um, and then obviously mom would drive anywhere to go see see me compete or take me compete somewhere. Um, I think she mentioned she might be driving to Quebec next year now. So <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> we'll see what happens there. But um, like this upcoming weekend, not like this weekend, but next weekend, mom's Mother's Day gift is for us to all be together at uh, the Kalahari Resort for the Infinity National Championships um, at a tournament. So, you know, it shows how, how big karate is in our lives. But, you know, she just wanted to be together. That's all she wanted for the for her um, her special day. So that's pretty, pretty sweet. That's awesome. And of course, beautiful tributes to both mom and dad. Uh, I know those are two people that are obviously very important to you. So I wanted to give you the opportunity to, to shout them out. And now before we close the show, we've got uh, a game that I think the first time we introduced this game was with Dawson Holt in the previous episode uh, where we did a draft. And for Dawson, we went five athletes deep for sword. And then I think we also did it for CMX forms. And I was talking to Ben a little bit before this show about uh, maybe what drafts we could do if we want to do two of them or if we wanted to do like all time or just current or how we wanted to do it. And Ben, of course, wants a challenge for a bow draft. And so we have decided that for this draft, we are going to go 10 deep. So each of us are going to draft 10 bow competitors to be on our roster and, uh, and you guys in the comments after the show are going to vote on which roster you think stacks up better. So I'm going to be holding my phone so that I can kind of type out who gets who in my notes app um, so that we're not totally lost here. Um, but that's going to be the way this goes. We're going to do a draft of bow competitors all time. Um, the only stipulation is we're not going to include active bow competitors because that's awkward because Ben is active and like has teammates that all do bow and the, is, there's no reason to get into that. Right. But anybody that is not an active competitor, single bow draft all time, we're going 10 deep. This is going to be a lot of fun. You guys are going to hear some names by the end of this that you may not have heard before because we're going. Think about it. There's going to be 20 competitors drafted in this imaginary draft that we're doing. Ben, as the guest, you get the first overall pick. Who are you taking in the bow draft? I'm taking the one and only Jackson Rudolph. I had a feeling that you were going to do that. I had a feeling you were going to do that, and so I'm just I'm not going to speak anything else about it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to let you take me and we'll just, we'll just take it from there. Yep. But thank you. I appreciate the compliment. So Ben took me, uh, I'm going to go ahead and go a couple steps up the, the lineage and I'm going to take Casey Marks Nash <laughs> with my number one pick, which means that Ben's having to change his next pick. Cause he obviously didn't expect me to steal Casey right there. Yeah. Um, I mean, I figured you would try, but yeah. <laughs> uh, next pick is Ben. Now that makes it hard which one I want next. I've got some interesting ones I might need approval on just to be safe, but I think <laughs> I well, you know, I think we're good, but you never know. Um oh man, that makes it tough. 
Oh, good. We're, we're on three. We're on pick three. Come on, man. I know, but there's so many good ones. I'll go. Oh, but that's all time. I'll go Corey Luckis. Corey Luckis at number uh, number three overall pick. So Ben's obviously got a, a little CMX focus on his roster. He's got me. He's got Corey Luckis. I've got Casey and Ben. Corey's a great pick, but you messed up because I am taking Michael Bernardo as yeah. my number two pick. So I've got Casey and Bernardo. I'm going old school. Ben's got me and Corey. Ben, who is your third pick? That's who I was debating between this, those two. Um, I will go. Oh, that's weird, though. I don't know if I can do that. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Hmm. Can I take Reed? You can take Reed. It is a single bow draft, so you'd be like specifically doing Reed single bow. When we get a double bow competitor on, we will do a double bow draft, which could actually be pretty interesting. You can probably only go five deep on that one. <laughs> and obviously, like I'm just going to say it, Reed's going to be the number one overall pick in a double bow draft. Like There's no question about that. Um, but anyway, so you can take Reed. Just keep in mind that you're getting like single bow Reed. It's not double bow Reed. Maybe like nine or something. Yeah. Um, but you could also get his trad, his trad weapons. You could. That's true. Um, hmm. I'm coming out. I'll go. Dang, I wasn't even thinking like trad or CMX. So now I'm, <laughs> now I'm in Let's see. Let's see. You took. By the way, in the comments, feel free to jump in and, and let us know who you'd be picking where. I can't see the comments, so I can't. That's okay. Oh, whatever. Um, let's see. Let's see. I'll go with. It's not current. I'll take Lauren. Lauren Carney is Ben's third pick. All right. I respect it. I respect it. So I've got Casey, Mike Bernardo, and my next pick is going to be Ross Levine. Million. That's who I want next. And now we're on to Ben's fourth pick. Okay, so I'll take him off. I, I love that Ben did his research. He's got a list here. He's ready. Well, you know, I had to erase everybody you've said. So I will go, I think, a little bit of a sleeper. Mike Welch. Ooh, good pick. Good pick. Shout out my boss. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but Ben, you messed up again because you, you heard me take Ross, and now you're going to let me get his sync partner. You're going to let me get Nate Andre. I didn't know. I'm, taking, I'm taking Nate Andre next. All right. So, Ben, your roster is myself, Corey Luckis, Lauren Carney, Mike Welch, and your fifth. I will go Billy Ledger. Ooh, stole one of my favorites. Okay. So Ben's taking Billy Ledger. I watched that form of his again, and I was like, man, this is good stuff. I think I watched it right before I went back. <laughs> nah, it's an awesome form, man. Okay. This is where things start to get a little bit more difficult, in my opinion. So yeah. I, my roster is Casey Nash, Mike Bernardo, Ross Levine, Nate Andrade, where do I want to go next? I've got some pretty, I've got some pretty inventive options in here. I've got some pretty creative ones. Um, let's see. Where do I want to go next? I'm gonna. I also want to. I'm trying to balance like people that I don't think that you'll think of, so that I can yeah. give them a feel in later rounds. You know what I mean? So there's some that I'm like I. I think I'm safe to keep them in my back pocket, which is why I'm not saying them yet. Um, I am going – so I'm not going to go too off the wall yet. I think that I need some more CMX. I think that I need – I don't have any trickers on the roster, although this is a bow division. But there is – there's a couple of, of pupils of mine that I could take. But we don't have anybody that was a straight-up tricker that had really good bow tricks that was ahead of his time. 
ah, there's two that I want to take here, and you're probably going to steal the other one, whichever one I say. I'm going to roll with – I'm going to roll with Aiden Considine. I'm going to take Aiden Considine. And I'm, I'm afraid that you're going to take the other one that was on my mind. Aiden Kennedy. Uh, yep, that's exactly – I was thinking between the Aidens. I was like, man, and then Aiden Kennedy was the other one. Okay. That brain coming back, you know. All right. Yeah, I was about to say, like, he, he – can we can we consider him active and disqualified? No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. No. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, so the Aidens are off the board. Um, okay, there's another one that you're going to think of really soon, so I need to go ahead and steal him. He was on my underrated list. I'm going to go ahead and take Connor Griffith off the board. He's fine. Yeah. He's mine. And Ben, that means we're back to you. He was going to be my next one. Mm -hmm. So I'll go get a little variety in there. I will go. And if, if you uh, have to decline this one, that's okay, but you better not. Austin Jorgensen. Monkey Staff was on my list. That was yeah. one that I didn't think you were going to go grab. Okay. Austin Jorgensen. For the monkey staff. Okay, how many deep are we? That's one, two, three, know. four, five, six, seven for Ben, and then that should be six for me. <laughs> My seventh pick, man, Austin Jorgensen was a good one. Um, okay, I'm a little, I'm a little scared that you're starting to get on to some of my, some of my more obscure ones. So I'm gonna go back old school again, okay. and I'm going to take. I also want to make sure I'm not forgetting people because I feel like we've definitely forgotten people already. I definitely have, yeah. Um, I'm going to take Gary Waugh. That's who I'm taking next. Ooh. Dang, okay. Shout out Jason Warren. Jason Warren's a huge Gary Waugh fan. He put me on Gary Waugh yeah. years ago. Okay. Um, so this is number eight for me? This is number eight for Ben. Oh. Wayne Douglas. Mm, yep, Wayne. That's a good one. <laughs> Student of Casey Nash, of course. Oh, yeah. All right. So you got Wayne. Um, who do I want to go next? This is my eighth pick. So I've still got some wiggle room after this. I'm going to go with. All right, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and take another one of my old school ones because this person probably deserves to be picked higher than where, where they're going to wind up being picked because I was keeping her in my back pocket. We're going to go Bernadette Ambrosia as Whoa. my number eight pick. All right, all right. I don't have, like, any trad, do I? <laughs> you got to flush out your, your trad roster, my guy. Oh. Um... You know, I could. Still around, but not competing. I could take Derek Megan. You could take Derek Megan. Are you going to take Derek Megan? That's a solid trad pick. Yeah, I'll do it. All right, he's taking Derek Megan. That's his pick. I respect it. Okay. Now, here, here's where I got to think really hard. Um... Let's see. This is my this is my ninth pick. Uh, I think there's only. Yeah, I got to I'm going to go this direction because it would be criminal for her to not be selected, given all the things that she did for Bo, the lineage that she's a part of taking Becca Ross next. Yeah, that's a good one. OK, so I, and that's a that's a steal to go with it with my ninth pick. That's a steal. Yeah. I'm kind of torn between two. <sighs> And one of these, actually, I should have mentioned earlier for underrated, I think. Um, this is my last pick, so I may as well throw them out there and just so people can debate it, right? Make it interesting. Okay, so uh, the easier one, or the more obvious, I guess, would be Nate Andre. I took Nate. I took Nate already. Oh, you did? Yeah, I took Nate with my fourth pick. Oh, never mind. <laughs> I will go, and I should have mentioned him earlier for underrated, Vincent Scarduzio. Good pick. Okay, I respect that. So you, okay, we're we're getting we're getting some Americic blood in, in the late rounds here. Derek, Becca, uh, Vinny Scarduzio. Okay. All right. So 
Ben rolls with Vinny Scarduzio with his uh, with his last pick, and then my uh, where do I want to go here? I'm going to read off my roster: Casey Nash, Mike Bernardo, Ross Levine, Nate Andre, Aiden Considine, Connor Griffith, Gary Waugh, Bernadette Ambrosia, Becca Ross. Taking a, taking a couple of, of good females in the last few rounds. Might need to go back to the males for the next pick. Both of the Aidens came off the board in terms of some of the more recent guys. Uh, oh, this is tough. This is tough. And what's tough is there, there's multiple names circling, but trying to pick one is the hard part. Yeah. I could go a little bit more obscure with this one and try to match your Austin Jorgensen and go with a soft stylist. That might be the right move. Trying to make sure that I don't forget anybody that I would really that I would really regret missing. Also trying to think of any like crazy bow trickers that I don't want to leave out. And I, I mean, I'm just going to say some names that are circling my head. There, there's guys like a, a prime Cole Eckert, obviously pick and read for single bow. You can make that argument here as well. Man, there's some there's some good picks to be made. Um, and then you got your guys that were really good in 13 and under, but never really like competed much more after that. You got your like Ryan Wells, your Ricky Morris. You got some of those guys. Yeah. But I think in the interest of of needing a soft stylist, and I think I've seen some video of some pretty gnarly uh, Wushu staff forms by this person, uh, I'm going to keep my my Lady Warrior train going, and uh, we're going to take Ming Lu. We're going to go Ming Lu with my last pick and get that staff form. Um, I'm pretty sure that I've seen film of it, and I remember it being crazy. Um, <laughs> my mom commenting when, when I'm debating that, that she has a life to live and I got to hurry up and pick one. Um, but anyway, so now I'm going to lay it all out for you guys in the comment section for you guys to debate who's got the better roster. So Ben's roster, Ben's got myself, Corey Lutkus, Lauren Carney, Mike Welch, Billy Ledger, Aiden Kennedy, Austin Jorgensen, Wayne Douglas, Derek Megan, and Vinny Scarduzio. And then on my side, I've got Casey Nash, Mike Bernardo, Ross Levine, Nate Andrade, Aiden Considine, Connor Griffith, Gary Waugh, Bernadette Ambrosia, Becca Ross, and Ming Lu. And then I see some in the comments that we've left out. Um, obviously, Kyle Montagna, old sync partner of mine, he's somebody that we could have considered. Um, and then I see some mentions of some people that are still active. So this is only competitors that aren't still active. Um but man, I, I just keep thinking of, of some names that we didn't get to. There was one that just came to my mind that it just it just escaped me as soon as I thought of it. Who was it? Um, I want to say it was a relatively recent CMX person that I just thought of, and then it left. Dallas Lou had a pretty cool. Dallas Lou, yeah, Dallas Lou is who ran across my mind. So he's another one that that uh, that didn't make our list here. So, but that that's the crazy thing about Bo is that like if you look at <laughs> and then your mom is saying that that you win, Ben. Uh, and, and, and you can make an argument for that, Ben. You got yourself a good roster, my man. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I actually think unlike some of the drafts that Dawson and I did, where it got pretty lopsided pretty quick, um, I, I think that I think that that one's a, a pretty pretty evenly matched draft there. Uh, but anyway, that's for you guys in the uh, in the comments to debate. Ben, I appreciate you accepting the challenge of wanting to go ten deep on a bow draft. Uh, and then uh, if anybody's got some different opinions about that, maybe you can come on the show and we can debate it a little bit. Uh, but that was a lot of fun. Ben, thank you so much for your time coming on the show, man. This has been awesome. Got to do a whole lot of bow talk and uh, kind of exercise those parts of my brain that, that there's not a whole lot of people that I can exercise it with. So I appreciate it, man. And uh, congratulations on the big win in Quebec. Looking forward to some more big performances from you at the Battle of Atlanta U.S. Open right around the corner. Uh, any last words for our audience here, my man? Oh, thanks so much for having me on. It's a lot of fun. Um, make sure to research all those people we just talked about if you haven't seen them. Um, and, yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. And, hey, one more announcement. If you guys want to train with this guy and a lot of his teammates at the JPM Legacy Seminar, Brand new and improved seminar coming at you at the U.S. Open. Make sure that you go sign up. Go to the Team Paul Mitchell Martial Arts Instagram page. Tap that link in the bio. You'll get to train with Ben and a whole bunch of his teammates. Forms, weapons, sparring, you name it. 
two different sessions. I highly recommend both of them because it's going to be different content in each session. Uh, you can also, if you do both sessions, you can switch between fighting and forms and weapons. You have the opportunity to work with more of the athletes. So highly recommend the JPM Legacy Seminar coming up at the U.S. Open. It's going to be on Thursday in the morning. No overlap with any of, of the divisions. Our athletes have to go and compete in sync that afternoon. So it's in the morning. I want to say... I want to say 10 to 1. 10 to 1 is the time Thursday morning. Um, so definitely you guys go and check that out. Um, then respect the T-shirt there, the little vin vintage Jax Rudolph Seminar Tour T-shirt. But, yeah, JPM Legacy Seminar. Make sure you guys check that out. Again, Team Paul Mitchell Martial Arts Instagram page, at Paul Mitchell Martial Arts. Click on the link in the bio. Get yourself registered for the JPM Legacy Seminar at the U.S. Open. Thank you to Black Belt Magazine for hosting the Jax Rudolph podcast. And thank you to all the viewers who make this show possible. I appreciate you and I love you. I'm your host, Jax Rudolph. This has been episode 126 of the Jax Rudolph podcast. And I'll see you next time.